So welcome everybody to our Ask the Experts about growing your own cut flowers. My name is Diane Blazik. I'm with National Garden Bureau and I have with me Gail Paps. She can wave, woohoo! She's helping me with the behind the scenes and you can thank her for um, you being able to find out about this webinar because she's the one who does our social media and marketing. And what I'm going to do is um, introduce our panelists and then let them talk a little bit about themselves. We'll give you eh, maybe 60 seconds to see what you can fit in. Um, and then we're going to jump into a little slideshow about some of the most popular uh, varieties for home cutting gardens. And then we're gonna dive into all the questions that we've collected and anybody here on the webinar can all add their questions into the chat. So put them in the chat. If I don't ask your question right away, it's because I already have it on my agenda and it's further down on the list. So we'll get to it in due time. Um, so, oh, one more thing is because this is a meeting format and not a webinar format, it is always helpful um, for me anyway, if uh, when viewing this meeting, if you go into your settings up at the top right and put it on speaker view, because then you're actually going to see the person who is speaking instead of everybody who is attending. So let's start with our panel. Um, Hillary Alger is from Johnny's Selected Seeds. You can wave Hillary. Hi, and we have Jessica Kudnick from American Taki. Hi, Jessica. And we have Michael Wells from Harris Seeds. Nice royal wave there. Okay, um, who wants to go first? Hillary, I, I introduced you first. Do you want to say a little bit more about yourself or, and or Johnny's? Sure, um, happy to do that. Thanks for having us, Diane. Um, so I am the flower product manager at Johnny's. Um, I'm one of the two people who uh, work on flowers at Johnny's. I've been, um, I've been with Johnny's for about 18 years, about half of that time working in flowers. Um, we have a really um, nice and growing flower assortment, and um, I really enjoy growing flowers in my own home garden. Awesome. So I bet from your experience, you're going to be able to get off, give us a lot of do's and don'ts like been there, done that. Don't do this. <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. Right. Don't we all um, have those kinds of things to share? Right. OK, uh, back up to you, Jessica. You want to introduce yourself? Uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. I'm actually in the southeast, so I'm in Georgia. So a lot of my experience will um, be reflected through the hot, humid summers that we get and then the very mild winters, which does affect um, what we can grow. I'm with American Taki. We are a seed breeder of cut flowers. And um, like Hillary, I so you know how the, there's that saying where like the cobbler's kids have no shoes. I am not the cobbler. I actually have a lot of plants and cut flowers that I do grow, even though I work in the industry. So I am happy, yeah, to share and talk about cut flowers and nerd out with you today. Michael likes the nerdiness aspect of it, I think. Yeah. So, okay, Michael, tell us about your plant nerdiness. Awesome. Yes, I do love to talk about cut flowers. Is any of these people who know me know I'm a little obsessed. Um, so I'm Michael Wells. I'm the ornamentals product manager at Harris Seeds. Uh, similar to Hillary, there's two of us here at Harris on the ornamentals team. Um, I've been with Harris about 12 years. Um, my background is in cut flowers, um, both retail florists, wholesale florists. I was a cut flower farmer for a while. So a little bit of all of it, some greenhouse growing too in there. So, um, but my love is cut flowers, anything cut flowers. So, and I'm in uh, Rochester, New York. So a lot of my background is in the Northeast um, with growing. So excellent. Let's have fun. Okay. Um, so one of the first things we thought we would do is just go through a quick slideshow here of some of the more popular flowers that are grown as cut flowers. So I was going to go through that. And then I'm going to close out um, this presentation just because it's easier then we want to see uh, the beautiful faces of our panelists. So I'll go through these and I'm sure you guys will all be referencing some of these uh, crops 
uh, as we talk about how to grow them. So we'll go through here and they are alphabetically as long as I did my alphabet correctly. Um, Asters is one very popular. Celosia is another. This is actually an AAS winner, Celosia Asia Garden. So I had to pick, put that in there since I also represent All America Selections here. Um, Cosmos is a very popular cut flower. Dahlias, I mean, who doesn't love dahlias? That's amazing. Uh, gladiolus, and this is the year of the gladiolus for National Garden Bureau. So there will be another webinar all about gladiolus at a later date. Then we have Gomfrina and marigolds, snapdragons, always fun, sunflowers, oh my goodness, who doesn't love a sunflower, right, Jessica? Yeah. And tithonia. And Michael, you mentioned something else here in the background that you uh, wanted to point out. Uh, Jessica pointed out, but oh, hibiscus sorry. mahogany splendor um, is a great foliage. Um, so keep that in mind. Okay, so even though I picked the photo for the Tithonia, we're going to talk about uh, this mahogany splendor also. And Verbena benariensis, this is another AAS winner, a very recent one called Vanity. And last but not least is our beloved Zenias. So those are some of the top ones. And while I take this off the screen, then I'm going to lob it back to you guys. And let's talk about what types of uh, flowers can be used. Does it have to be an annual? Does it have to be a perennial bulb, etc.? So talk a little bit about that, about the breadth of um, different types of flowers that are good for cutting. Well, First thing that I point out is that our audience that's with us today are home gardeners or, or um, basically not a commercial grower, which has to grow for their customers. So you as the home gardener, you're growing for your preference. And so that's what I really want to emphasize is that this is a chance for you to, if you like it, you should grow it. And so you're not really bound by those constraints of other people uh, maybe telling you what to grow. So when we look at like some of these easy ones, like sunflowers and zinnias, it's really, well, what, what do you like? Do you like the, the purple ones, the red ones? Um, as long as it's been bred for a cut flower, you're, you're pretty much guaranteed for success with a few of the tips that you'll learn here today. But um, I really want to emphasize, this is your chance to have your own um, say in what goes into your garden. And piggybacking off of Jessica, I'll say, one thing that I, Diane mentioned, I'm a little crazy when it comes to cuts. So um, I'm the type of person who will try anything once for cuts purposes. A great example is the hibiscus mahogany splendor that Diane had mentioned. Um, that's a good example. The breeding company put it out not for cuts, um, specific for bedding purposes. And I started cutting and was like, this is great once you get it hydrated. Um, but this is an amazing thing. So I say try anything and see how it goes. Just remember certain flowers, again, for gardening purposes, certain flowers will only last a day. So some stuff you'll probably not want. Um, yeah. Do you, do you want to um, expand on that? I mean, let's, let's just jump right into that. Um, how would you know if something is not going to do well as a cut flower or based on the experience of our panelists, which ones do you think don't do as well? I mean, we want people to be successful, right? So we might as well give them some insider tips here. Like, well, I tried this and. Well, I think starting kind of at the basics, um, if it's been bred for pot and bedding, it's going to tend to have a shorter um, plant height. And so that's going to be a really big clue. If you want something to cut, you want stem length, right? And so as you're making your selections, sure, look for that purple zinnia, but definitely go. I mean, so I work with a breeding company and our goal as a breeding company, when we breed cut flowers, here's what we're looking for. We're looking for stem height. We're looking for long lasting blooms. Um, and then also, yeah, to add interest to bouquets. So uh, starting there, that's the, uh, the basics, is that really look for what kind of description um, the plant yeah, gives you. So cut flowers will be bred for those types of characteristics. Yeah, that's um, Michael and Hillary. I would love for you to talk a little bit more about that. Like on your websites, how do you... Um, mark categorize your cut flowers like can somebody just go in and search for cut flower types on your websites 
Yeah, so we um, we have a cut flower category where we um, place all the, the flowers that are common and um, can be grown as cut flowers reliably on a commercial scale. I will say that, you know, similar echoing Jessica and Michael, um, in the home garden, you don't need um, massive long stems. So um, certainly that sort of cut flower assortment is a, a sort of sure way to get long enough stems for cutting, but also um, be creative, experiment. Some of the things that are not meant for commercial farming of cut flowers also make, you know, are, are perfectly lovely for a home garden cut. Yes, similar on the, the Harris website, we do have a breakout of cut flower annuals, cut, cut flower perennials, um, and some of the bulbs as well. Um, but again, with what the two ladies were saying, um, one another example of something that I use in my garden, um, but we don't promote it as a cut because of the stem length, although technically there's there are some varieties out there in the industry, um, but they're hard to get for the home garden. Um, like Angelonia is one that is great as a cut, but it's it's not anything we're going to have on our websites as a cut flower because it's short, but it will be fantastic in your bouquets. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, as Hillary mentioned, as you're a home gardener, you don't need the long stem. Have fun with it. Well, that's a question that I was thinking of too is... Um should should you okay obviously you guys make it easy at, at johnny's and at harris because you have them categorized but if somebody is looking like let's say they're at the garden center and they're looking at plants is there a certain um plant height or stem length that they should be looking for to know it will be a good cut flower i say take your favorite vase and eyeball how much stem you need for your favorite vase and that can then help you decide what will work for for your own home bouquet yeah so like Hiller mentioned there are standards for commercials but this is where we we get to have fun as home gardeners is that we're not really bound by those rules and so what I, you know and sometimes even um you know, I, I'm big into upcycling. So I'll take my favorite, a favorite glass jar that has some preserve in it and then, you know, make, make some short stems that fit into that. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a little bit, I, it would be nice if there were clear answers, but that's also the joy is that at Home Gardener, you get to customize it for your needs. I think Diane has a rule of thumb, like um, if you're, if you just want to be sure something that's going to reach a maximum of 24 inches that will give you a 12 inch stem and then you know some plant left behind you're not taking the whole thing yeah. okay good rule of thumb 24 inches if you want to play around with different types um like jessica was saying a, a small vase you know i see some things out there that people say are cut flowers i'm like but it's like this but you know i kind of forget it it doesn't have to be this 24 36 inch centerpiece you you can do all kinds of things so you're right that that's when you get creative um and earlier i think i forgot to tell everybody if you have questions put them in the chat um gail has has put that chat function up there she will also be posting various um links to their websites and and gail maybe you can put a link to johnny's and harris's um cut flower sections of their website so we can give everybody a quick and easy link um so i showed you some of the the top most popular cut flowers but of those or maybe there's something i missed i don't know what would you say if somebody says okay i'm going to start for the first time ever growing some cut flowers what would be some of the easiest ones maybe each one of you go through and say hey i think these are the two easiest cut flowers to grow and you can't all choose zinnias. So choose who's going to do zinnias. <laughs> I, I, my guess is we all would say the same too, but that's yeah. just my guess. <laughs> yeah. One of you, one of you I ladies. Should make on the count of three, we should say, what are those top two that we're thinking of? One, are we saying two, it alphabetical? three. Sunflower, Sunflower and zinnias. zinnias. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's perfect. Okay, I think we have a unanimous decision. So if you're going to start something, go for sunflowers and zinnias. Those are the easiest ones. So let's ask it kind of in a different way. What might be difficult? What might you you run into with a sunflower or a zinnia that would be a little bit of a challenge? I know they're the easiest ones, um, but what might you run into? Pest. Everything wants to eat the seed when you direct sow out in the field. So I would say pest. 
animals. They can be birds. They can be uh, your neighbor's cat, maybe dug up <laughs> something, you know? Um, well, and I kind of want to maybe talk about challenges um, is if you are growing sunflowers and zinnias for um, cuts, um, so sunflowers, you know, they tend to be a single stem. And so if you want to cut multiple times throughout the season, I would say one thing we may not think about is succession planting. And so having sunflowers seeded in your garden, maybe every two weeks, every three weeks, that way you can, um, cause once you cut a sunflower, it may branch, but you're kind of done. Um, not so much for zinnias. Zinnias are, are, are fun in that you can cut from the zinnia and still get more flowers coming. In fact, that's a great way to keep it flowering is to keep cutting it. But for sunflowers specifically and some of those single stem flowers, succession planting. Okay. Oh, go ahead. I, just, I wanted to go back to Michael's comment about pests. So for sunflowers, in particular, um, pests obviously are an issue throughout the life cycle of the plant, but um, early on, um, small mammals and birds are gonna wanna take that seed or that really young supple seedling. And one thing you can do to protect those pretty easily is to add a row cover after seeding or transplanting. And that will keep, um, you know, for the most part, keep those critters off of there. And if you're doing small quantities in your garden too, with what Hillary's saying, I've seen people like take milk jugs and all sorts of random stuff to do that. Again, if you're doing small quantities, so. Yeah, and we're we're probably for the most part talking to people that are doing small quantities. Um, otherwise they would be attending one of your commercial webinars, but but yeah, um, putting, putting something over so that the birds don't get to them, so the critters don't um, take over. Yeah, you gotta, gotta do that, things like that so that, uh, we don't share them with mother nature. Um, we do have a question here. Um, let's see here. We were talking about the shorter stems um, on some flowers. So what about your thoughts on posy bouquets? So can you define posy bouquets and then talk about maybe some of the things that might be good to put in a posy bouquet? I'll mm -hmm. ask the question. So is posy bouquet okay, like a handheld size? Yeah. Um, that's I my think impression. Yeah. That's my impression as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Posy, I would say a posy bouquet, like they're, again, they're going to be short stems, small, little, you're just making a bunch. That's, again, for this purpose, anything short would work. Um, the items that we talked about, like everything that's listed um, that Diane has on this, that we went through um, would work for posies, even if they're short stems. Um, but again, I think it all comes down to what, what you want in your house, what you want, and if you're giving them away or so. Exactly. So then there's another question. Um, the question is, how can I get longer stems on dahlias? And my question as an addition is, should you try? If you try to get longer stems, will it make them weaker? So that's a two part question. How do I get longer stems on dahlias? And should I try to? So we actually at Taki don't breed dahlias, but as a home gardener, I can comment on this. Um, so, you know, what might have been confusing is the photo in the dahlias that we did through the slides. Those were definitely bedding type. Those would be hard to get longer stems on. But if you get the tubers that are meant to be um, longer stems, first off, start with that. And then second, you really need to do a hard pinch. And I know I hate doing it every year, but I basically wait for my tubers to get two, maybe three uh, leaf breaks. So watch the tuber, it'll, it'll, it'll come out of the soil and then it'll break and then it'll break again. Those are like leaf breaks. Wait for, um, yeah, two to three leaf breaks and then pinch the main thing out. And I know it's gonna feel wrong, but that is the best way to get nice uh, quality uh, cut stem dahlias that have you know, good stem length and then also um, a, su a substantial head size for that flower. It's going to feel awful. I know. <laughs> and that's honestly with a lot of the cut and come again type plants, I would say it's the same, same concept, zinnias, um, some celosias, um, that pinch really can help get that stem length. Um, well, multiple 
uh, longer stems. Yeah, what, you, what you're doing is encouraging it to branch, but branch in a controlled way. Yeah, something to know is that um, oftentimes you're setting back the sort of first bloom date of a plant by doing that. So you're stopping the energy going to that first early bloom and redirecting it into more, um, a little bit later stems. And so, like Jessica said, it can feel wrong. You're, you're pinching out that first color you're gonna see, um, but it's worth, it's worth the effort um, and it's worth the wait. Maybe you just let one go you know, so that you can see, get that early color and then maybe all the other ones you can, uh, you can do the pinch so that way you can satisfy yeah. that instant. I mean, I want to see color too. So that instant need for a color. But not so, with dahlias, you got to get that one early. Okay. So that's what I was going to ask. So when you're talking about this pinching, um, that was in regards to dahlias. Does that also apply to like many of the other crops that we showed in the beginning? Yeah, any any plants that are branching. So um, any any yeah, that's anything that's gonna anything that's gonna produce one stem, one bloom, like um, single stem sunflowers, or um, I think there's stock. There's some other crops where um, they've been bred to be a one cut. You, if you pinch those, you won't get anything at all. So watch out. Same with that. definitely don't pinch your glads. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. Good to know. Okay, so we were talking about the easiest ones to grow. So we decided that that is zinnias and sunflowers. What are some of the more difficult ones? Like, okay, you might want to need some practice with these. If, if you were to name two of the more difficult ones, but that are certainly worth it, which two would you name? Before we jump into that, Diane, uh, can we emphasize real quick, the reason I think we all said sunflowers and zinnias is because you can direct sow those in the garden. Good. Point. Um, yes. And so what in my thoughts, some of the more difficult ones will be if you're not used to starting your own plants indoors and you're starting from seed, that's where the complication could come in um, if you're not used to that. Okay. So. So that's a good start. So literally, if you have to start them indoors, just a little bit more of a challenge, but we know that a lot of people are able to do that. Um, okay, yeah, so let's let's jump back then. Which ones might be more of a challenge, but are totally worth it? So for the Southeast, and again, this is also my personal preference as a home gardener, I love scabiosa, I love straw flower. Um, I love yarrow, but those I do start um, earlier or just easy enough. I've got a cut flower grower that does um, starts for me. And well, they have like a plant sale. Um, it's some of your local plant sales can, can, you can find some of the more unique and different ones um, that they'll grow the transplant for you. But I like those because one, they perform well in my area. So knowing, you know, what performs well in your area. I'm in the Southeast. These are heat and humidity tolerant, but also I like to do dried flower um, crafts at the end of the season. And some of these ones I've mentioned also work well secondarily for dried flowers. I, I would add to that, um, you know, for me, um, fragrance is really something that I value in the garden. So um, snapdragons, they can, they're small seeds. They can be a little tricky to start and take a while. Um, sweet peas, they take a while to start. They have to go in really early, but that there's nothing like that fragrance. It's sort of irresistible. Um, and then stock is another one that I really love, um, Mathiola for the fragrance. Um, and, and, and it, again, all those just take a little bit of time indoors and a little bit of pre-planning. All great options, all great choices. They're like all of my favorites. Um, yeah. The other I would throw in would be Celosia. Uh, for many gardeners, you'd want to start that inside, and they do need the heat to really produce. So that's the other one. Start them early, and uh, they're fantastic. Okay, and somebody's asking. Okay, so we talked about the easy ones because they're direct so, and then we talked about some challenging. Which ones are really easy to start indoors? other than sunflowers and zinnias, because we, we just decide we're going to direct sow those. So which other ones would you start indoors? I think there's some the snapdragons oh, that Hillary mentioned. Snapdragon stock. Um, 
yeah, I loved all, the whole list that, that she had mentioned, but those, uh, yeah, we would start indoors. And looking through the list that, like the ones that we pictured, um, asters are one that could go either route. Um, uh, but the other, the ones on the list, just I'll run through it real quick, that most people would probably start indoor, the celosia, uh, gumfrina, marigolds, again, could be outside, snaps, uh, tithonia, can go either way, but the verbena also indoor. Okay, great. So which one of you wants to tackle growing bells of Ireland? Somebody has a question on that. Just in general, growing bells of Ireland. Um, it's a cool season crop. It really, um, in the heat of the summer, um, first of all, it, it prefers to be direct seeded. Um, and then um, in the heat of the summer, the plants you know, they, they've just sort of had enough and um, they won't grow and they can, um, they can succumb to the heat of the summer. So you really have to seed it quite early and it can be challenging to get the seeds in the ground um, sort of when it's early enough for establishment. And it Michael. Sounds like that one, that one, sounds like that one's a challenge. It's um kind of like when uh, all the commercial growers are planting pansies and they're trying to get them started in, in winter, I mean, in the heat of the summer in order to sell in the fall. So it sounds like it might be a little bit of a challenge along those lines. Yeah, de um, depending on where you are, you might be able to fall so um, for early spring establishment. What or kind of zone might be able to do that, fall so? That's a good question. <laughs> we'll find out. We'll report back. Not a problem. Um, okay. Any other comments on Bell Bells of Ireland from Michael, Jessica? Okay. We'll, we'll follow up with some additional there. Um, but somebody is asking about deer resistance. So yeah, I mean, cut flowers, great thing to grow along the edge of your property, right? Well, that's probably exactly where the deer are going to come in. So any uh, favorite types that might be deer resistant? I have really terrible deer problems in my yard um, and a few that have worked for me are um, really well um, daffodils. The deer will taste them, but they won't go uh, much further than that. Yarrow is really um, beautiful. Once it's established, easy to grow. The deer don't seem to bother that. Um, also columbine and um, hellebores is another one that I've had really good luck with. Yeah, so uh, Georgia, we have we have a, a deer problem. And so um, like Hillary said, there are things I plant outside the fence and then there are things that I plant inside the fence. Hellebores being one of them, the deer don't bother them. Daffodils, they don't bother. Yarrow's tough. Anything also with sometimes a scent. So there could be like, um, or has, you know, toxicity, like digitalis, um, they don't okay. seem to bother as well. And you can do digitalis, uh, foxglove as a cut flower. Um, Agastash has that kind of um, scent to it. And so they tend not to bother that here uh, in Georgia or some of the, some of the, and those are nice because they're perennial and they'll keep coming back. Some of the thistles are, could be a good option. Yes. That sounds almost rude. I love Eryngium. It is beautiful. I know. I and they Econops, are. They're, beautiful. they're gorgeous. They're just, oh. Yeah, exactly. There's other things those deer can eat. Uh, somebody, somebody is asking, um, and I think you've already answered this, but they said, are asters the only perennial on your list? But I've just heard you list about, oh, I don't know, five, six, seven additional perennial types. Are there any other perennial cut flowers you want to mention? So I will want to admit, when I saw the list of asters, I was like, oh, asters is kind of tough for Georgia. But we actually do have a, um, a native aster. It's called a, the Georgia aster. And so um, it is a perennial and um, will flower late fall and it works. But there also are annual asters too. And I think that's what maybe what we were thinking of when the cut flower list was made. Is there are annual asters as well. But I'll let yeah the rest of my colleagues talk about other perennial cut flowers. One that not so much for flower purposes, although they do produce a flower that generally smells delicious. Hosta for me is a great foliage to add into home bouquets. 
Um, I love the, the foliage on it. Um, and there's so many different options, heights, colors. Um, and again, the flowers actually smell delicious. So those are a fun one. Um, Delphinium is a great perennial. Now I'm like, where's my perennial list? Yeah. What about a stilby? Will they, do they do okay as cut flowers? Yeah. Okay. And there's yes. some new taller, there's some new taller ones coming out from seed this year, next year. Yeah, we've, we've got several in Georgia that um, both annual and perennial that work really well, a still be, um, have nice, nice stem length. Okay. So, you know, one of the ones that I didn't put on here, this is my daughter's absolute favorite. She, we always put this in her cut flower bouquets, but hydrangeas. Okay, let's talk about hydrangeas as cut flowers. Yeah, I think maybe our conversation has mostly been about like annual and small perennial items, but certainly there are bushes and shrubs, trees, and even like Michael pointed out in that Tithonia photo, um, the hibiscus that has interesting foliage and color. Um, there's definitely a whole segment of bushes being hydrangea being one of them that can be cut. Yeah, I've got about 10 different varieties of hydrangea in my yard that I hack every year for arrangements. So, um, one specific type, um, either variety or just type of hydrangea, or do you like them all? Lace the most cap, both, common whatever. use is going to be the limelight, probably that that's what most people, um, I have one called strawberries and something strawberry twist or strawberries and cream. Yeah. Um, are... that I'm kind of gaga for. The, the big thing to think about is some of the bigger, fluffier ones are a little harder to hydrate. So you just gotta, um, make sure you're cutting early in the morning, make sure you're cutting not in the heat of the day. Um, and there's different methods out there to help hydrate them as well. We're going to get to that later in the session is, is cutting and hydrating. And everything. Um, so, uh, Hillary, any other thoughts, uh, on flowering shrubs, some favorites that you like to use as cut flowers? <laughs> Um, a couple of favorites um, in my garden are lilacs. Um, I know they're not, they're a little tricky for cuts and they're not you can super do lilacs lilac. where you are. We can't do those very well. They're yeah. just, it's just like, you know, the most amazing thing in spring, early summer. Um, and then I really like nine bark um, for summer and, and fall a foliage in cut flowers. That's, or, they're just so beautiful and productive and um, like the bronzy ones for fall arrangements are, are pretty amazing. Um, and then, you know, just, you know, some of the other plants that I have around for food, like um, blueberry and raspberry foliage can be really beautiful, kind of a dual purpose. I want to add for the Southeast, uh, the whole class of viburnums. Um, there are so many different types and um, I tend to do very well here in the Southeast with those as cut, cut flowers. Okay, so my theory is basically anything can be used as a cut flower. <laughs> I mean, it's either the flower or the foliage. I remember I went to one of these um, American grown cut flower dinners years ago and they had used basil, nice long stems of basil. And man, when you walked by it, it smelled amazing. Um, and the Thai basil, you know, and had the, um, the purple tops help me out help me out with the variety here which one am i thinking yeah, no, queen yeah, of siam is that it queen of siam yeah, yeah. That's, that's one of them yeah. yeah talk about perfect items for a posy bouquet any uh rosemary lavenders um basils mints yeah. exactly okay um wow i am getting inundated with questions here here's here's another one is there a good method to create long stem tulips in zone seven or eight <laughs> yeah, so I'm in zone eight. And um, the way that we can get good cut flower tulips is that, um, well, first off, you know, you need to plant the tulips in the fall. And then, you know, make sure you look for varieties that are uh, quite tall. And uh, this may be a surprise, but, and this is one of those things that may feel, make you feel uncomfortable. It does me as well. But tulips in zone eight, we really, I mean, they might come back a year or two. But knowing that they're not going to do well in coming years will make this easier. When the tulip is starting to develop, you want to yank the whole thing out, bulb included. And what that gets you is those extra inches um, versus cutting it at soil level. And that's going to get you stem length um, to make sure that you have a nice bouquet of tulips. 
So I, I definitely help myself knowing that these tulips don't really over or over summer very well here anyways. So yank the whole thing up and then you can plant a new crop in the following fall. Yep. Good tip. I've, I've seen that done. I've never been able to do it myself, but okay. Yeah. Just give it up, plant some new ones. Um, now we have a question for the Northeast. Any tips for growing sweet peas in the Northeast where summers are hot? Is it best to start them indoors or direct seed? Should they be grown in part shade for summer blooms? And we have two panelists up in the Northeast, so. I would say definitely start them early. Um, I think direct seeding, it might be possible, but really, really tricky for short season. Um, so start them early. It's one of the earliest, for us on the farm, it's one of the earliest crops we start in the greenhouse. Yeah, get them in as early as possible because they're not gonna perform well in the middle of the heat, so. And the seedlings are a little bit, they can take a light frost. Um, you should, you know, definitely if you're putting them out really early, protect them, but they can be, um, they can be tough. So they can take a little, they can take cool weather. Okay, so good luck with your sweet peas. Um, here's somebody that's a newbie and um, they want some explanation of the terminology cut and come again. We addressed this in our salad greens webinar we had, so let's address it with cut flowers. Can, um, can you explain the cut and come again? I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, basically, it's a plant that um, you come in and you either trim the flowers back or you trim back the flowers and take some stems and foliage with that and it's going to reproduce and give you another crop or multiple crops of flowers um, through through the season as long as the plant stays healthy. Yeah, the kind of the opposite of it is going to be, uh, Jessica had mentioned some of the single stem sunflowers earlier, like they will put out one sunflower and then they're done. Um, there's some celosia like that. And there's a couple other items that like you will get one stem out of them and then they're done. But cut and come is the majority of the stuff we listed and we've been talking about will uh, give you a second or third flush or just keep producing all season. Yeah. And maybe Diane, it primarily applies to um, annuals. So I think for a lot of perennial crops, they have a bloom, you know, they're not going to go through the season. They have a bloom cycle or, or maybe two bloom cycles. And so they're not going to keep producing flowers for you after after that cycle is complete. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so now we're all getting our hands slapped because nobody mentioned peonies as a flowering shrub. And it's like, okay, who has a peony and doesn't cut it and bring it indoors? So, okay, peonies, we raise you up high. We're, we adore you. Um, sorry, we forgot about you earlier. Um, here's another question. Um, what would you grow for a dried flower? You, you talked about that. So um, maybe name one or two favorites that you would like to use in your, to dry and then use in a dried flower arrangement. Whoop, okay. Michael has something to show. Okay, Michael, what do you have? Amaranthus is a must have. Um, Amaranthus wow. Mira is my favorite, but Amaranthus is one that's great for exploding all over me. Um, it is great for dried arrangements. Um, and it's another one that is a great direct sow item uh, for your gardens. Yeah, I love things that work in the heat and humidity. So gumfrina, great for cutting fresh and also great for uh, dried, pro dried flower projects. Yeah, and I would, I would add straw flower. That one's pretty easy and, and like comes in a really wide range of beautiful colors. That and, um, and gonfrima, gonfrima dry really easily. Um, so not only are they, you know, sort of easy to grow, the drying process is easy. I think ones that hold their color, it's like the three that we've mentioned. So um, gonfrina, straw flower, yarrow, those are like, yeah, maybe top three that are easy for, for um, later dry, dry use. And then amar well, yeah, the amaranthus, that's, um, that also works well here. So I like it as well. And Salosha, uh, Gail had mentioned Salosha in the chat. Salosha is a great one too. Excellent. Okay. So we got some tips there. 
la la la. The other question is, does anybody have a good guide? Do you have one on your website or something you recommend or a book for having something in bloom for cutting each season? I would almost go as far as to say for each month or for each week. How do you how do you do that? The the basic answer I would say is a mix of everything we're talking about. You want annuals, you want perennials, you'll want woodies. Um, shrubs, sorry, uh, all, a mix of all of that to get you throughout the year. Cause you could realistically harvest all year long. Like I even think of some ornamental kales. If you give them some coverage in the winter, um, you can harvest those later on and evergreens you can harvest all season again, thinking some, down flowers. Yeah. Trees like dogwood that have like a red stem, which add winter interest to, to bouquets as well. So. And blueberries. So I think they may be asking for like book specific uh, or like guide specific suggestions. And so I don't know if, yeah, we can, you know, list specifically, but there are books out there that a uh, few that I have um, that even talk about seasonal, you know, cut flower use and, and how to have something planned out for, for all seasons of the year. You know what we're going to do? I'm going to ask our three panelists, um, once we're finished, send me some links to some of your favorite resources and books. And we send out an e-newsletter e after we finish this and after we have the recording and we call it additional resources. So trust us, everybody on, on this webinar, um, we will gather up some resources from all three of our panelists and then we'll send them out to you. So you have those links and references. That would be good. Yeah. I don't have a, a favorite reference right now, Diane, but I have a tip and that's, um, you know, if you're lacking color in your garden during a certain season, go for a walk in your neighborhood or a local botanical garden or a neighborhood near you and see what, what sorts of things are blooming um, where you have gaps. It's a really good way to kind of fill it in for your specific location. The nice thing too, is if you're adding in annuals as well, the annuals are more pro programmable for when you want them to bloom. So you can look through any of the vendors websites um, or catalogs and see like days to bloom um, and plan accordingly. If you have that, that hole in your bloom time as Hillary was saying, like, so plan your sunflowers or your zinnias to hit at that time. Um, yeah, good tips. Um, somebody mentioned um, ornamental kale. So Jessica, your American tacky breeds ornamental kale. Okay, so how do you get those long stems so that you can use them as cut flowers? So I, I, I imagine our audience probably hasn't seen this, but um, believe it or not, we, there is a thing called cut flower kale and it is the vegetable, but it's been bred um, to elongate and it's not bolting. I actually had we just had a big show and I had someone come up to me and say, is it, is it bolting? No, it's not bolting. It's bread to, to give you a stem that you can cut. So um, yeah, and it comes in amazing colors. So like as the temperatures drop, it actually initiates, the, it grows green and then it'll initiate a color in the center. And it'll look like kind of like when you strip away the leaves, it'll be like kind of like a mini rose or um, there's different flower, uh, not flower, leaf shapes, feather type, really frilly fruffly ones and so for southeast the way that looks is that we're gonna sow it kind of like we would do our our edible kale um, we start planting the seeds like late july and august you know to get the young plants and then we'll plant them out in, in the garden or the field or wherever and then over the the war as you know the fall temperatures are still kind of warm it'll grow it'll start to get very tall and then as our winter cools, you know, winter temperatures start to come, that's when it'll color up and it's ready to cut. So that's how a, um, a season might look for in the Southeast. But Michael mentioned they're actually incredibly tough as far as snow and frost. And so you can keep them in the garden um, for a long time. And it goes, you know, this might also apply. So for succession planting, so start an early, early crop and then um, sow some for a little bit later. And if you do have those um, leaf types that are super interesting, you know, they work well in your bouquet, even, even green as you wait for them to color up in the winter. I think they're underutilized. I just, Absolutely. I, they're gorgeous. And yeah. So anytime I've had, 
Yeah. Anytime I've had an arrangement of them, people freak out over it because they are they roses? Are they what are they? And it's like, no, it's scale. So but they are very different. The ones that Jessica's referring to, if you go to your regular garden center to get kale, likely, unless they're crazy like me, they're going to be the bedding plant type. So just keep that in mind. If you see a six pack of them, unless they specifically say a cut flower type or crane um, is yeah. one of the more common uh, series, um, they're going to be the short types. Yeah, when Wait. you go to the garden center, it'll say kind of like, you know, spacing, like height and width, um, and most likely it's not going to be a cut flower. So this is where you're going to want to know your specialty seed suppliers like Johnny's and Harris, where you can get these, these um, cut flower kale. So you mentioned crane is one of the varieties. So the crane series. Yeah. Okay. Do either of you, uh, Michael or Hillary, do you have another uh, series of variety that you guys offer that would be for cut flowers? I just, I'm sorry. I'm kind of honing in on this. I think that it's very fun. The crane has the largest and we're not just sucking up to Jessica because she's from the breeding company, um, but they have the largest uh, variety selection. They've got the feathery types. Keep your eyes out for next year for some roughly types. Um, uh, there's the more regular leaves. There's lots of, lots of options. Yeah. So what he's saying is that there's the crane series, which is like the big overarching <laughs> series. And then within the series, you've got all the different leaf types. Ah, uh, there. Okay. If you can see what Michael's holding up. Don't mind me being weird. <laughs> but that shows what they look like. And you're right. They, they do look like a rose. So, okay. So. Awesome. Um, let's talk about growing cut flowers. Okay. So, you know, what if I'm living in an apartment and all I have is a balcony, can I grow some cut flowers in my containers or raised beds or whatever? You can, uh, I grow <laughs> most of my flowers in raised beds. Um, that's just what I have here and what works well for me. Um, certainly some varieties and certain crops do just fine in containers. I think one thing that, or a couple things you might want to keep in mind is that those plants are going to get tall. And so having a container and maybe a support structure that's going to stay, keep the plants upright will be really important. So as they grow tall and heavy, um, or, you know, select varieties that are sort of, um, a mid height you know, maybe, maybe not the tallest ones for those containers. Good tips. And what about staking? You know, naturally we think, okay, these, these flowers are going to have longer stems. So do they need to be staked or is there something special I should do in the growing process or in my selection of varieties in order to have some that are less work and I don't need to stake them? Since we forgot to talk about peonies, imagine your peonies in the garden and you have that, you know, usually it's a, a green round thing to help support your peonies. So the same applies for, for any of your tall cut flower items that are in your garden. A lot of them will benefit from having some sort of su support structure. So whether it's like a round item or whether you actually tie it to a stake, which that's what we mean by staking, you put a, a tall something, it could be metal or plastic or wood next to the plant to tie it to it. Um, some people will have like even in a, a raised bed, it's big enough, you can put netting. So the netting actually, instead of something to crawl up it, you actually, it's horizontal. So the plants grow through it and then you raise up the netting to keep it supported. Uh, so supporting those tall stems can look like a lot of different um, options. I think most um, most seed catalogs and websites will, um, or any informational resource for cut flowers will recommend um, trellising or support for things that particularly need it. If you're in a really um, uh, windy area or a place that's prone to have summer st storms come through, I would really recommend um, putting up some sort of support proactively. So, okay, um, next topic would be harvesting, how to harvest, when to harvest, what to put them in. Do you use a, um, um, the not the plant food, plant food, cut flower food? Um, do you buy it? Do you make your own? So 
whole topic here, uh, harvesting and vase life. So who wants to get started uh, on that one? I think it could be really complicated or it could be really simple. And for the home gardener, um, I think just good, clean water, good, clean containers, harvesting your flowers, um, not in the heat of the day, but um, a cooler time of the day. So whether that be early in the morning or um, a little bit later in the evening, um, those are the primary tips. The, you know, the floral food is mostly um, that's mostly used for a product that has been harvested, processed, stored, and then moves on to your kitchen table and needs a little bit extra boost um, for the vase life. If you're cutting from your garden blooms that are in really good condition into clean water, you don't really need to treat them, in my opinion, with anything. Um, they're going to, if, if you're harvesting fresh blooms, they're going to last for you without any additives. Yep. I would agree. Okay. Um, so yeah, although sometimes I have, you know, we all have those in our junk drawer, a little few packets left over. It, it won't hurt as long as you're mixing, mixing it appropriately. I mean, why not to use those up? But as far as, so I actually did watch the salad greens and I know that one of the frustrating answers is it depends. Um, so for when you harvest, it depends. Uh, Luckily, you're walking out to your garden to harvest. So if you need to take something to a friend because you're, ho uh, you know, being a guest or you're hosting and you need it in a more open bloom, well, then, yeah, cut it when it's um, when it's open. Do know, though, that the um, the more open the flower is, then the shorter the vase life, although it's super fresh, you're still going to get many days of joy. Uh, but if you so, for example, sometimes I go visit my uh, my brother and um I will actually cut my flowers when they're a little bit more closed. They're showing color. So I know they're well-developed and they're going to open up, but I cut them a little more closed. That way, when I'm traveling, um, I buy myself some more time and then they get uh, plenty of days of enjoyment when I arrive um, as their guest. So um, luckily as the home gardener, not only are you just dealing with fresh because it's right from your garden, but you get to customize it for what your needs are. So if you need it right away, wait for them to open up a little bit more, but if you need to buy yourself some time and want them to last a little longer in the vase as they slowly open up, um, you can cut them a little tighter. Yeah. And another good thing to think about too, is from the hydration part of it so that they start to take up the water is some days it may make sense. If you know, you're going to go to your brother's house tomorrow, harvest the day before, give them time to drink, um, before you're taking them back out of water, if you're going to be carrying a bouquet out of vase. Um, there are some items, like we mentioned basil, we mentioned the hibiscus mahogany splendor. There's some items like those that when you harvest them and you put them in your bucket or your vase, they're going to start to wilt. Just let them sit for a few hours. They'll pop, they'll tend to hydrate, but you'll know before the next day if they're going to make it or not. So there is that piece. You know, Diane, one thing I actually have overheard when I've been around groups of people is um, talking about plants is they're like, oh, I need to put it in full sun so it it, it, um, it feels better. Uh, so I would I would advise against that. Sunlight's OK, but um, so bright light inside the house, that's OK. But you, your flower, your cut flowers do not need to be in in full bright sun, hot um, or stressful conditions. So the cooler, the milder the temperatures, um, the better that they will not only hydrate like Michael's talking about, but the longer they'll last. Excellent. Um, kind of going back to the growing, I skipped over my question and somebody asked it too. Um, and I'm sure the answer is going to be, it depends. Um, but what about fertilization? What about fertilizers for cut flowers? Um, the answer is probably gonna depend on which variety and, and which, uh, crop class we're talking about, but can you comment on fertilizing your cut flowers and on maybe fertilizing too much? What happens if you fertilize too much? The best thing you can do is get your soil tested. That's where you start. Because if you don't know where your what your soil can already provide, um, then you're bound to, to make miscalculations. First thing, get a soil test. 
Does anybody else want to comment on what might happen if you fertilize too much? What if you don't get a soil test and you're just like, oh, well, I'll fertilize every week? What might happen? I know there are some flower crops that won't flower if you over fertilize is one issue you might have. So they um, stay in a vegetative mode where they produce a lot of leaf tissue and they just don't flower. Um, you know, sweet peas is one that can be a little tricky like that. Um, yeah, in general, I think a, a rule of thumb is that um, compared to vegetables, flowers are not very heavy feeders, but you do need to pay attention um, and healthy soils are gonna be what helps them thrive. So like Jessica said, a soil test. Always the first first thing. Yes, exactly. So um, we only have about three minutes left. And I'm sure we can go over by a minute or two. Um, but I think I would like each one of you to just summarize. You know, what's what's your one tip on, okay, if you're gonna grow cut flowers, or this is the thing I've most learned about cut flowers, what might be just your closing thoughts on growing your own cut flowers? Put you on the spot, didn't I? I'll go, I'll go. <laughs> um, well, I think, I think, you know, this is not a technical tip, but um, I think it's important to know what your goals are, like keep it fun but know like what you're after. So if you're growing cut flowers for a friend's wedding, that's a very different goal um, in terms of variety selection and um, stem length and face life and color palette, et cetera, than just having, um, you know, blooms color in your garden throughout the season. Um, so just for example, for me, I have a lot of exposure to, um, annual cut flower crops through my work. So the, the flowers that I really value in the garden are um, spring bulbs and um, perennials and things like that, that, you know, that I don't get to see every day. So know what you want before you start. Got to plan it out, exactly. I would say, think about what you're familiar with. Like if you're used to growing small bedding marigolds, you're used to growing the short zinnias, you're used to growing um, some of the shorter sunflowers, like just, it's not much different to get the taller varieties um, or start your own taller varieties. Like that's a good start is the stuff you're familiar with, um, just taller versions. As a, as a yeah, home gardener, I, I, like Hillary had mentioned, I look around me a lot of the time, what's growing, what's flowering. Um, I do have the benefit that I have a, a farmer's market nearby where I do have local cut flower growers and they love to talk about flowers. And so when sometimes I'm making selections for my own home garden, I, I pick their brain and I talk, I network, I talk to, to what other people are doing. So I think don't be afraid. Michael said, just try it. I mean, you can always grow it again the next year or change. Um, and don't be, don't be afraid and, and start talking to other people that are, that are doing the growing too. There's so much we can learn from each other. Absolutely. Yes. And gardeners are always uh, willing to share. So that's the good thing too. So, okay. Um, yeah, I, there we go. The hour is gone. And, um, like I said, we could probably uh, divvy this up and, and make an entire webinar like just on harvest, post-harvest care and things like that. But we wanted to keep this high level. We wanna inspire people to try growing their cut flowers and they'll just keep expanding and expanding and the world will be a more beautiful place. So we thank you, Michael, Hillary, Jessica. Thank you so much for your expertise. This has been fun, very interesting, hopefully very inspiring. So now it's time to go out, go outside, go plant something. It's time, <laughs> indoors, outdoors, wherever you are. So thank you very much. And we will send out an e-newsletter follow up with some additional information and the recording and happy gardening, everybody.